Good morning. I'm here to um, orient you a little bit to the CSER program, and in particular, uh, I was asked to talk about the top five consortium-wide products, but before I do that, I'm going to give you a couple announcements. One is that when we break at 11.25 for the first set of breakout rooms, neither of those is in this room, and you have to take your stuff out of this room because they're resetting this room. So a lot of times we leave our stuff behind, but not this time. And then at the second session break group of breakouts, Elsie and Genomics will be switching rooms because of the size of the rooms. So just be aware there'll be people to direct you, but Elsie and Genomics are switching rooms. All right. So CSER, as most of you know, is just winding down its first uh, project um, years. And uh, it has had this mission of getting the genome to the clinic fundamentally. And it is different than a lot of NIH programs in that it has a very high clinical involvement, over 200 clinicians of all types involved. And um, we have had a really interesting time, and hopefully uh, CSER and Emerge can share lessons. As I talk about the top five projects, I'm not going to talk about these two because I hope everyone knows about them. These are the two joint CSER Emerge two papers. Um, that were published uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we'll start with this paper, um, which was an actionability and return of results work group paper, and all the products I'm talking about today were network-wide products. This paper is one in which we took 6,503 people from the exome variant server and decided to not only estimate the rate of actionable incidental findings in those persons, but also get classifications to be submitted to ClinVar for those. Um, and the idea was that these would be variants we'd probably come up with again, and if we were concerned that they were pathogenic or misclassified, um, this would be a way to get ahead of those variants. And so this is one of the tables from the paper. It summarizes uh, that we found several percent of variants in European, it depends on how you want to count the likely pathogenics since some people don't return those and a lesser number in African ancestry uh, people. And this has been a highly cited paper, and I was actually participating in a bioethics symposium uh, about six months ago, and a speaker who was from continental Africa showed a version of this slide from uh, this work to talk about uh, the challenges in, in African ancestry populations and, and healthcare disparities in that population. And, he noticed me smiling in the front row. He said, oh, Gail's smiling, but he didn't realize it was my slide. <laughs> so, but I was really pleased it had made all the way to Africa. Um, so that was good. Uh, and the, the next uh, paper that was also an actionability return of results work group paper, we called the variant bake-off. Um, and we worked on it for a long time. Uh, and what we did here is take 99 variants and classify them, uh, each one in at least three different um, of the nine CSER clinical laboratories, CLIA certified laboratories, and look for concordance across those variants. And what we found, and we found this whether we were using our own lab classification status or what were relatively the new ACMG classification uh, categories at the time, was only about 34 percent concordance. And so we moved forward and spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out where we were discordant and why. And this led to discussion and rule class clarification of the ACMG rules in, in, in ways that sites were interpreting the same rule differently. We could come up with a consensus interpretation for that ruling. And to be honest, sometimes that consensus interpretation was pretty clearly in the original ACMG paper, uh, but not read the same way by everyone. And we were helped by having uh, people who were involved in that paper on our committee. And we were able to get the consensus up to 71 percent, but still not achieve perfect consensus, although most of the disagreement was by one category. Um, this led to several spin-off papers. Uh, the, do we have a, yeah. the pathogenicity calculator. So one of the things we found is that some of our discordance were because one site or another had misadded those, all those classification criteria that you use under ACMG to come up with a final classification and put it in the wrong class, even though they had characterized 
the classifications the same way. And so one of the groups uh, developed a calculator where you just put those classification codes in and it will tell you the correct pathogenicity classification and that's been very useful to avoid simple errors. Another was um, the general lack of consensus around what qualified as co-segregation evidence and so that was a follow-up paper on proposed uh, co-segregation criteria to standardize that. And then the last, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, was a survey of the current practices for genomic sequencing across, uh, I think it was 21 labs, yes, 21 labs, looking for best practices. And they came up with some recommendations that are listed here, um, things that should be in the reports, lists of genes, minimum thresholds for coverage, and um, making sure people understand when a target has below the expected coverage, and in particular if there's known pathogenic variation in regions with below expected or desirable coverage. Um, the idea that having a diverse group of people in case review, especially having clinicians in case review, was useful. Um, the orthogonal validation of some variants as necessary and analysis guidelines uh, and then questions about reanalysis are all addressed in this paper and I think it's a very useful paper for um, clinical labs. The third uh, topic I wanted to cover today, uh, also a consortium-wide product, was to look at informed consent for genomic sequencing and what was done by this group was evaluation of all the um, nine U01 CSER consent forms, interviews with the genetic counselors and coordinators who were obtaining consent, and then they tried to summarize what were the questions that came up in these conversations, what misconceptions did the participants have, and what content did the people who were doing the consenting feel was most important to cover. And I'm not going to go through this table here, but some of these things um, are things to think about a little bit more. Of course, patients often ask us about privacy, the impact on insurance. Um, but it's really important to also cover some things that they may not ask about, such as their misconception that a negative result means that they're completely genetically normal and, or that no future changes will be seen. Or sometimes people believe that their genome will change over time. While it's true that our interpretation can change over time, it's not usually the case that the genome uh, does. So this is a very helpful paper in um, preparing to consent people who are having genomic results, both in the research and in the clinical setting. Uh, the next thing I wanted to highlight was a product of the pediatrics work group, and that was a discussion of sequencing results for the pediatric population. And of course, they followed very standard ethical guidelines of what's in the best interest of the child. How do we work with parents as surrogates for their children? And when do you need to obtain pediatric assent? And I can't go into the many details of this paper, but for those working in pediatric populations, I highly encourage you to, to look at it more closely. The fifth thing that I wanted to highlight today is a product from the practitioner education work group, not the physician education work group, but the practitioner education work group, uh, because it's a much more general uh, targeted audience. And the idea was to provide healthcare providers just in time information on how to understand genetic lab report tests. And, um, this was a very uh, collaborative cross-site uh, product, and we were trying to target short, you know, things that can capture practitioners, you know, busy practitioners' uh, attention with visuals and get to the message as quickly as possible, not have it be related to any particular lab, but useful for anyone reading a genetic test. And now this has just as of yesterday gone live in a collaboration with the American Society of Human Genetics on their website. And this is just a screenshot below, but there's the link above. But if you go to ashg.org and follow the education and practitioner uh, tabs, you will find uh, this toolkit. And you can 
work your way through it. And so we, the next step with this will be to you know, beta test it a little because it just went live yesterday, but then to do some marketing to make people aware that this tool exists. So this may be a very good tool as eMERGE sites are starting to release results to um, their practitioners who are not specialists uh, to be aware of. And um, we'll hear more about it today at the um, physician education breakout uh, this afternoon for those of you attending that. Of course, in, f in this short amount of time, I couldn't summarize all of the important work. Uh, Robert Green uh, headlined a summary paper, which we call a marker paper, of consortium uh, products a little while ago, and I recommend that paper. And then this is us all uh, dressed up and looking fine. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Rex, who's going to tell you about Emerge.